everyone. Uh, welcome to our short presentation on the planet scale monitoring, handling billions of time series with Prometheus and Thanos. We are Sebastian and Miko, senior production engineers from Shopify Observability Metrics team. And we want to share our experience building a truly planet scale stack of metrics monitoring with you. So we recently migrated from a SaaS solution to in-house open source stack for metrics monitoring. And in this presentation, we want to show the system and share the challenges we encountered on the way, learnings we had, and how we had to adapt the system to the scale we ran at. So as we already introduced ourselves, let me take a moment and guide you through what we want to show you today. Uh, we will take uh, you on a journey, how we build it internally in the first place, where we arrived with the solution at the end, uh, with a few quirks and challenges we encountered on the way there, and how we tackled them for the benefit of company, but also wider community. Uh, we will also provide a bit of Shopify-specific context first, since the company profile presents few unique challenges to the whole system uh, that we introduced here today. So now let me fill you in on a bit on the context of Shopify, unique challenges, and infra choices, so Sebastian can present the actual system architecture for you. Shopify is one of the few biggest Ruby shops in the world, and the stack is deployed as a significant portion of the company infrastructure on Kubernetes. Uh, so some specific context why this company may have unique characteristics that may provide for a tough set of constraints for a system like this. It is very globally distributed. It's a global company with millions of merchants around the world. And believe me, there is some great research available on how latency affects conversion rates of buyers. So developers and merchants are very much interested in a consistently low latency to their shops. The scale of elasticity is a problem. Infrastructure is in motion all the time, very dynamically responding to the merchant demands, but also even during the periods of relative quiet, we are dealing with billions of active time series in the system. Hundreds of Kubernetes clusters are present, but we scale both in the number of them and uh, how, they, how big they are. Uh, we very clearly see the ebb and flow of the day and night cycle in particular regions, but also specifically for our company profile, flash sales and big yearly events matter. So commerce happens all day every day, but Black Friday or pre-Christmas sales are definitely noticeable in the grand scheme of things. Uh, Shopify is also the biggest flash seller in the world. So I mentioned the flash sale, so what it is. It's basically a merchandise drop that is very limited in quantity or time availability and presents a very unique challenge uh, for monitoring and infrastructure scaling. So some flash sales are over in five minutes or less, and biggest of them sell hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of items during that time. This presents a big problem to Kubernetes Autoscaler, where with the very big clusters, it can barely respond in time to this immediate demand incurred when the floodgates open to the new drop. So this is a zero anchored graph on y-axis. And as you can see, even during a fairly normal week, we can easily see almost 100% scale-ups happening in the infrastructure over the day when it comes to number of monitored resources, in this case, containers. So additionally, something that may not be fully obvious to folks not working with Ruby day to day, or PHP or Python, it is not great at uh, having facilities to share counters between multiple requests. So that results in additional challenges to efficiently utilize native Prometheus client libraries. Uh, on our way to sidestep this problem, we are using StatsD uh, for the Ruby portion of the apps in the infrastructure. But that's a whole other challenge in itself. How do you push this and not pull into a Prometheus infrastructure? Which my colleagues, Pedro and Philip, will gladly explain in tomorrow's first presentation. Now I'll hand over to Sebastian to dive a bit deeper into the architecture of the specific system components. Uh, thanks, Miko, for the introduction. I'm Sebastian. and. Um, I will guide you through the components or through the architecture from a matrix um, collection to querying now. Um, I will introduce you to the architecture of the system we built that, Shopi that monitors Shopify infrastructure, but also um, all the applications that run inside Shopify, and also show um, how we address the challenges Miko was just talking about. Um, yeah, like as I said, we first look at the single components, and at the end, we will fit this. Big pic we fit this together to a big picture. 
So let's start with in-cluster uh, metrics collection. In, in Shopify, we have hundreds of clusters with thousands of very different workloads. And um, at, as, metric, at, as targets or metric sources, um, we have roughly those types, um, natively instrumented workloads or exporters um, that get metrics in from external services that can directly be scraped. Also, infra, um, metrics, infrastructure metrics exporters like CubeSight metrics, node exporters, or C advisor, and so on. And we call metrics coming from those internally standard metrics because we deploy them in each cluster and they are um, available for every workload and every cluster. And then Miko just point, um, hinted at this. We have the stats D metrics coming from workloads. Like, I won't go any deeper here because, again, tomorrow's this other talk where Pedro and Philip will um, give a deeper insight on this. Um, we have the stats D pipeline. Essentially, you just write, um, you write stats D into it and then we aggregate and, it, it, and it, it, it's becoming um, scrapable by um, Prometheus. Um, yeah, so when we initially started, like our first deployment for this was Prometheus Agents plus HPA, and for the target distribution of our Prometheus Agents, we used um, standard, um, the standard hash mod. This wasn't working for several reasons. Um, the first was while the number of targets for each Prometheus agent was, um, was nearly evenly distributed, the problem was that the sizes of the targets um, was vastly different. So some, um, while some agents were idling, other agents were ooming. Um, then if you scale up or if HPA scales up the Prometheus agents, like adding more agents, um, we had this problem with redistribution of targets, so there's a lot of movement. And also HPA itself, um, we used uh, memory and we used memory and CPU, um, the scale up was um, slow. So what we did is we implemented this custom operator and it works as follows. So what it does is we have the service discovery part, which is um, the service discovery part from Prometheus. It gets a standard Prometheus config, discovers all the targets in the cluster, and then writes those, <coughs> sorry, and then writes those targets in a queue where workers take those targets, um, scrape them once, create a report. Um, the most important information in the report is just the target size, put it back into uh, and send it back to service discovery. And then what service discovery does, it, it scales the Prometheus agents accordingly and creates configuration for the Prometheus agents so that um, the distribution um, of the load over the Prometheus agents is even. Yeah, so, um, and this, this worked. And yeah, Prometheus agents just, they, they have standard configuration, then they scrape, and then they remote write in what we call regional receivers. Um, in, like, in Shopify, um, we have multiple big regions, and um, we decided to have one receiver deployment. I will, uh, I will explain the deployment um, shortly. Um, we have one, uh, sorry. In Shopify, um, we, we have those regions, and we have one deployment per region. So why do we do this? Um, first, no single point of failure, so if one region goes down, other regions still keep working. We can use internal regional networking for remote write because the, um, all, the, all the clusters are, all the client clusters are in the same, um, in the same network and low ingestion latency and overall less networking issues and also we don't need to pay for egress and ingress traffic. So the first deployment was just um, standard uh, receivers, so just uh, multiple receiver instances, but we had several issues there. Um, the most important issue was it wasn't really stable during rollout or when one receiver went down because they, like a receiver has then both the role of forwarding and ingesting um, metrics. So what we did, it we split up the routers to solve this problem. Uh, we split up into routers and receivers to solve this problem. So only the routers need to know where metrics go and receivers will um, ingest metrics, and, but also um, upload blocks every two hours um, into uh, object store for further processing. Um, then there's this concept of tenants for uh, in, in, in Thanos, and we like um, what we do is we have one tenant per cluster, and um, this configuration or the hash ring is created by uh, uh, 
Thanos Shard Ma Manager, which is kind of operator for routers. And what it does, it looks into our global view for our infrastructure. And if a cluster is added or a cluster is removed, it creates a tenant. And then this tenant is a CRD. And according to the CRDs, it will then configure, uh, create a hash ring. So um, uh, yeah, I forgot to mention this. We have replication factor three. So it will um, at least add like three nodes to each um, for each tenant. But you can also have more nodes, like because like our clusters have um, different sizes. So for big clusters, you maybe want to spread. Um, uh, uh, tenant over like six or more nodes, and that's what the shard manager does because he has uh, this, uh, the shard manager has all the information. Yes, um, we also have the possibility if a, if um, if a cluster crows, cr which happens often, to rebalance or crow tenants um, by running a simple command. Yeah, and those metrics from all the regions, so we have multiple of those um, regional receivers over the world, can be queried via uh, uh, query deployment in front of receivers. Um, but before we look at querying, let's have a look at how we handle long-term store, like the, block, the blocks that are uploaded to the object store. They are first horizontally and then vertically compacted. Uh, other way around, sorry. <laughs> and also downsampled, and then we have um, stores, like two set of stores. One set of stores is responsible for everything until four weeks. And this is much, this is, um, much beefier than the stores that handle everything from four to 12 weeks, because most of the um, queries that are run are below 12 weeks. Yeah, and in front of that, again, we have a set of queries. And this lives only in one region, um, and it, it will be queried. It, it can be queried <coughs> via the queries. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so now how do we use those metrics to run rules, alerting, and query? Let's start with, let's start with rules and alerting. Um, rules and alerts are evaluated by running global queries against all regional queries. So um, there, there will be an overview coming. And um, yeah, we have the, like, they send alerts to alert manager, and Edit Manager can send them to Slack on PagerDuty. Nico will show you in the next slides how the configuration of that works. Um, rulers are just uh, rulers. Um, also query um, the uh, receivers, the, the regional receivers, and um, write the result of the rule evaluation into uh, another set of receivers, which work as as the regional receivers. Uh, it, uploads block to object store, but it can also be queried by the user directly, which we see here. We call this the global querier. The global querier is a set of queries that query the regional receivers, um, that queries long-term storage, and that queries results, um, uh, rule results from the rule receiver. Sorry. And for caching, we have a query front end in front of um, the query, yes. And the metrics, everything can be queried via a Grafana instance, which is customized via plugins. And Nico will now tell you how this works. Yep. So, so far, uh, Sebastian explained to us how this actually works on the back end. So what does the system power? Grafana, naturally. Uh, but with a few customizations created specifically for our developers in the form of custom plugins. So what are the twists that are present in our setup? For example, new metric list, uh, detail views of metrics, which I will show you in the next part. Uh, but for example here, alert configuration. Since Shopify is a pretty big organization with hundreds of teams, we decided to enhance the standard UI. We are exposing more team and service-centric UI for our developers, making sure that they can always find relevant information as the first step in, in the investigation that they are going through in the alert case. Since we are talking about metrics, we focus on that. But you can also see that we uh, directly link this information to other internal tools, so that it uh, makes it very easy to follow different observability signals relevant to the service straight from this specific UI. Uh, we also had to enhance the customer allows. Uh, so setting up a service in our company requires creating SLOs for them. And we also had to bend Grafana a bit to allow our users to track this uh, performance over time. 
As you can see, it relatively closely follows the idea set up in the previous slide of custom alerting. Same problem applies here, where many teams want to only be presented with their own specific service-centric views, so that's what we decided to focus on. So, as can be understood, this system is pretty new. There was a migration. Uh, this is only a few years in the making compared to over a decade of Shopify. Uh, so, migration happened, and we faced a few challenges on the way. As you already heard from Sebastian, most of it is related to proper deployment patterns, but not everything was possible to be fixed that way, and we either had to develop new pieces in the stack ourselves or contribute back to community uh, where we faced the challenges that were also relevant to them. Last year, my colleague Philip presented uh, on this conference earlier version of Thanos distributed query engine, which unlocked for us internally, but also for the wider community, since it's fully open source and used in Thanos. Uh, ability to query multiple times faster across very large queries happening over multiple queries or quer query layers. This is what uh, Sebastian explained as pushing down the computation as close to the source as possible. Uh, most importantly, we also got involved into a native histogram work, which internally solved some cardinality challenges for us and proved to be another factor in reducing operational costs. Uh, and in tandem with the distributed query engine enabled us to provide simple global alerting across hundreds of very dynamically scaled clusters. But what I'm showing you right now is something different. It's a fast metadata series querying. It's a view of this. Uh, we had built it on our own metadata querying to power a few components. Uh, fast metric search, which is especially useful uh, in powering uh, very easy to use uh, visual query builder. Uh, developers love to know ahead of time which, uh, with instant response times, what are the all possible value combinations of all the labels for the metrics, as you can see on the left side. Uh, metric cost components, which you can imagine help us to get some more buy-in from the teams uh, regarding the quality of data they produce and how this contrasts to the cost of actually storing them. Mm. And most importantly, uh, referenced in, which can be seen on the right side of this slide. Uh, I think this closely relates to the topic of previous talk. Uh, this helps to very quickly reference all the places that a specific metric is used. Uh, you can see like dashboards, other tools, SLOs, very easy to find where is it used, but most importantly, if it's used at all. Uh, so fast metadata querying is very important at our scale because native experience with our amount of metrics was unfortunately a little bit lackluster because of lack of pagination of results. Uh, that same system we hope can also help us more with cardinality control over time. But technology is hard, but sometimes the hardest challenges are human in nature. Uh, migration prompts us to work very closely with app developers to build even more observability or visibility tools in Grafana. Uh, let me give you one counterintuitive example how we decided to migrate between two very different uh, metric monitoring systems. Uh, we actually decided to not migrate metric dashboards from the previous vendor uh, to our in-house solution. Instead, we work very closely with developers to create new dashboards, uh, only inspiring themselves with what they already had. Mm, it was a very tireless work, but resulted in a better quality dashboards, uh, suiting better the needs of developers created with a, this new system in mind already, uh, while allowing us to leave the legacy dashboards behind, evaluating what was truly needed at this specific point in time. So now onto the final view of the system with Sebastian. Yeah, to wrap this talk up, I want to put this together and show you one picture. You see like our globally distributed regions here, like the, the placement of the regions doesn't have any meaning, it's just random. And as you can see again, we have the global queries, querying everything, um, and querying everything, and like users can do this via the, our Grafana deployment, then rules, rules and alerting, also using like querying everything from the regions. And um, one thing that like Miko just showed us, um, the, the UI is driven by so-called monitoring API, what it does, it, uh, it, 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 it takes in alerts and SLOs from the UI and creates the rules and alert config for rules and alerting. 
but it also extracts metadata from long-term store by going through all the blocks there, extracting the metrics names and labels, and providing this to the Grafana um, in the Grafana UI, uh, as, as Miko just showed you, so users can look into this. Um, yeah, and one thing I forgot to mention is this distributed engine. Um, Miko mentioned this um, briefly. This, this thing is, was really important for us because it allowed us to essentially uh, to, to, to query over our whole data set. With the Prometheus engine, the, the issue we had was that if you run a query over the whole data set, it, it first gets all the series, bubbles them up in the top level query, and along the amount of data we had there was too much sometimes. So um, yeah, the experience wasn't really good. And with the distributed engine, what happens is the work is pushed down. It's evaluated at the lowest level possible, and only the result is bubbled up and aggregated there. Yeah. So um, that's it. Any questions? We actually, <coughs> we actually have a decent amount of time for questions because I made you start a little bit early. Sorry about that. Hello. Hey. So uh, I would like to ask, uh, are you using persistence for uh, the receiver? And also, how much time did you invest in caching? Well, I mean caching for like uh, store gateway. May I answer? So um, we don't use persistence for receivers. Uh, I, hmm? <laughs> yeah, because this, and like, I mean, like you have those two hour blocks, right? And you upload them directly into, so like if something goes wrong, like if everything goes wrong, you maximally lose those two hours. And caching, we just put the front. I like, mean, the, the, we, we, we put the query front end on top of it, on, on, on top of the queries. We had to add native histogram support and configuration, like trying what works for us. Because it's like this, this um, time where you don't cache, like you have to find the right. Uh, I think it's 10 minutes, the first 10 minutes. Yes, maybe just giving a little bit more uh, context here. We use Prometheus in an agent mode very early in the system, in the regionals. So that does not have a persistence. But later on, when you already bubble it up to the big regions that are cardinal regions in our case, that's where we have some disks. But obviously, the most important part is using the LTS uh, tunnel storage. But the receiver idea. is no storage. That's the, it, it dies. It, uh, yeah, we up. don't really use this, this as storage. It's only like, a, in, I believe, only in memory queries for a couple of hours in our case. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'd like to ask, you mentioned that you do basically an initial scrape to size the agent and uh, basically size is based off the first scrape. Do you, did you then run into any issues where the initial scrape wasn't too big, but the number of metrics grew over time and potentially caused You mean the kills? initial setup without our operator? Uh, no, like with the operator you mentioned, there's the initial scrape that sizes the agent. I mean, no, how it does it, it runs in a loop. I think every five minutes it, it, it um, checks the targets again. So every target is um, scraped every five minutes, the reports are um, then new reports, and then if something changes, it will scale up and redistribute targets uh, to agents if possible, okay, uh, if you. necessary. Hi, I got a question from the live stream. Um, how do you shard rules? How do we shard rules? Well, actually, uh, as Sebastian mentioned, we use uh, cluster-to-tenant mappings. So we try to, as much as possible, uh, have rules sharded by a cluster or tenant. Right? That would be perfect. If you don't go uh, the very high-scale route, this is good enough. If you go really high-scale, uh, definitely go for native histograms, as Sebastian mentioned, that helped us a lot. And we actually are able to run fully global rules uh, thanks to that and thanks to the distributed query engine. That changes the game for us completely. Like it was impossible without those two 
uh, fixes upstream, and now that this is in the upstream, it changed the game for us. Hundreds of Kubernetes clusters, all the global rules, no problem. Thanks. Uh, did you consider like uh, splitting uh, like the data storage per environment, like for Thanos? Uh, we we had like a case where we have a mix of data like across environments, and we have somehow like um, we mix it up with uh, dev environments, and then like uh, Thanos uh, front end like went crazy a little bit, and we had to clean up the data. So we have to go through the object store and so on. Then we came up with this idea to split uh, Thanos storage per environment. I mean, you mean like uh, the, the stores I showed you? In the are you talking about the long-term stores? Yes, exactly. Like they are, they are sharded. So like we have multiple, like, as I showed you when we go back to this, this slide you see, this is not just one instance. Like we have multiple, sh multiple instances, and they shard per tenant. Okay, thank you. So Are there's not just one store running, owning everything. There's multiple stores running, at owning several yeah. tenants. Other than that, that's why we even have a regional layer of this. Uh, in case of one region getting corrupted, we but also not for long -term have uh, additional. Yeah, not for long-term storage, but before that, mm, we tend to find all the issues with the data before it ever reaches the very long-term storage. All right, thanks. Um, you said that you were using Hello? Uh, native histograms? Oh. Yes. Uh, yeah. um, and you're in Ruby. Uh, however, the native histogram are not part of the Prometheus Ruby client yet. So are you able to use it through the stats, the uh, instrumentation you have, or do you have? Specific es essentially, support? we had to add this native instrument, uh, native histogram support to every part. So there are, I think there are even some PRs up now. I'm not sure, but I think it's already merged. It's it's like for stats D, it should be merged. I'm not sure because I'm not working on this. For Thanos, there are some PRs, but this is experimental, right? So, but if you are looking for some experiment at scale. This works pretty yeah, rock solid. This actually improves the stability of the system. Okay, thanks. Hello. Um, how you <coughs> mentioned that you use uh, query uh, for global query review, which queries all the uh, store gateways and all the receivers, as I understood. And my question is, how many receivers do you have, and whether uh, this query uh, works stable? for a uh, big number of receivers? I can't give specific numbers, but let's say hundreds of, and not at the lower end of 100. So uh, your query uh, uh, sends a query simultaneously to 100 receivers and uh, uh, gives yeah. the I mean, I, I talked about this. This is why we need to distribute it engine, right? Because if you fan out to so many receivers, a lot of data come back. And imagine having multiple of this. So much more data comes back, and if you try to elevate, uh, evaluate this in one place, you will have too much data. That's one thing. Then remember the Bloom filters. In like, you actually only query the relevant uh, data in the end, right? Uh, you query a lot of endpoints, but most of the endpoints are irre irrelevant for the query to answer, right? Oh, I see. Thanks. Just, just one question. Uh, you're pushing the data to uh, the Thanos receivers in routing mode, uh, and then again to the receivers. Are the receivers dedicated to the specific clusters or customers, or are they uh, shared? So the um, if we go back to the slide you see here, the Thanos shard manager creating this um, hash ring, yeah. and so we try to assign tenants, and tenant is a cluster, to routers, uh, yeah, to receive us in such a way that this, the load is evenly distributed, right? Because big cluster needs more in-memory um, series. And we can rebalance this. So if it changes, we can run a command to shift. But this is basically why we even have this component, yes. to be able to like pin and easily move specific uh, TSDBs for specific tenants, or in our case, uh, clusters, right? 
Thank you. All right, last question over here. It's a late. Uh, you, thanks for the talk. You mentioned Bloom filters um, and not querying all regions, all clusters uh, for a query. Can you give more details about that? Like, how do you know when I send a query where to go search for the results? I mean, queries go to every receipt. Always. Uh, always, to okay. everything. I mean, we, we have, like, we have some restrictions per time, so like six hour, all, all queries um, below six hours don't, or two hours, I don't know, go to stores, but otherwise they go to everything. But like it's a no op response, right? So if, if, if it doesn't have data for the query, like nothing comes back. Or if you prefer, you can obviously uh, filter by specific tenant, then it will go only to that specific receivers that are assigned to the tenant, right? Uh, but we found out that most developers just yeah. don't bother with scoping the, you know, <laughs> it would be a perfect world where everyone was just scoping their queries very nicely, but if they don't, we actually are very happy with the performance of the fan out and comeback uh, with like most of the empty responses. All right, that's it. That's all the time we have. Another applause.